go ahead and change the day of the service. Yeah, like some churches will have their midweek service on Tuesday or Thursday for reason. Some people lose their mind. You know, that's not doctrinal. It's not like, but, but we have a tradition. If you mess with that, yeah. it's not people in your own Are you planning on switching over to Tuesday or Thursday? I am not. I mean, there's no need to here, but in some other countries, there's a need to. The days of the week are off. We did a church service on Sunday, right? Or the 6 a.m. or 5.30 a.m. on a Hello? Thursday because people are going out to work. That's part of, like, traditions where, like, instead of having, like, a morning and an evening, you kind of do, like, a kind of, like, an extended. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you're traveling a great distance. Yeah. You have the morning service. <laughs> Welcome to our evening service. Hope everyone had a wonderful, restful afternoon and maybe got your nap in, watched a little bit of football or did whatever you needed to do to get ready to come back. So I'm glad that you did come back and I know you'll be blessed and hopefully you have in your heart the idea of being a blessing and an encouragement to someone here tonight, including our missionary guest. And it'll be exciting to hear what's going on through Brother Mail's ministry. We've been able to partner with him for many, many years now. And uh, so I'm always excited to hear what the Lord's doing through that. Well, if you're able, I invite you to stand. We're going to pray, uh, have our opening prayer, and then Sean's going to lead us in a few songs. For those joining us through our live stream service, a special welcome to you as well. And uh, again, I know that God will bless you for choosing to uh, tune in and worship through technology this evening. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather in your house tonight. We pray that uh, we would sense your, your very presence here, that, Lord, you would move among us, that you would uh, show us uh, through your word and through your, your servant tonight what it is that you want to do in our hearts and lives. Father, as we often said, none of us here are yet like Christ, which means we have changing to do, growing to do. And so, Lord, help us to do that tonight. If you put your finger on something in our heart, may we just simply say, yes, yes, sir, yes, master, and be obedient to how you lead us. Father, again, thank you for your many blessings in our lives. Thank you for our church. Thank you for the opportunity to meet in this warm and comfortable place this evening, free of any, any fear of, of retribution for coming to worship our great God. So, Father, may you be honored and glorified and blessed. And we ask these things in your son's precious name. Amen. Brother Sean. So, number 53 up on the screens, we're going to sing When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Familiar hymn. Yeah. 
may be seated. So this next hymn, you know, I was looking at it, and I have to say that I'm not super familiar with it. Hopefully I'll remember it here as I sing it. So if, uh, if I have issues, uh, try to help me along here. Sing it nice and loudly. I probably do, that's true. Since the Savior found me, pardoned all my sins, I have had the joy and living hope within. Gone is all the shame and sorrow of the past. They're underneath the precious blood of Christ at last. Save, 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 I'm happy all the way. Save, 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 I love him more each day. Save, 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 I know he's mine each hour. He saves and keeps and sanctifies me by his power. Since the Savior found me, all to him I owe. For his precious blood has washed me white as snow. Now no condemnation, happy as can be. I'm glad that Jesus justifies and sets me free. Save, 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 I'm happy on the way. Save, 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 I loved him more each day. Save, 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 I know he's mighty how. He saves and keeps me, sanctifies me by his power. Since the Savior found me, I have perfect rest. Living in the realms of joy and happiness, leaning on my Savior, looking for that day when in he comes to come to gain his way in your way. Save, 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 I'm happy on the way. Save, 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 I love him more each day. Save, 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 I know he's mighty tower. Saves and keeps and sanctifies me by his power. Amen. I, I, think, I, I think I did okay. Amen. <laughs> okay. Christ for me. You know, the, the thing about Christ is that, you know, we oftentimes look at who he is like, oh, you know, my parents have a relationship with Christ, but really it only means something if you have that relationship. Christ isn't just for the pastor or me. He's for all of us. So let's sing this with truth. Christ for me. Good evening, and I am glad that you are here, whether in person or joining us via live stream. I know that there's a number of people that would like to be here in camp this evening, and so we're praying for the technology to work well, that it might reach out to you. We have Brother Jim Mails with us, and so Jim and Lori Mails are not uh, strangers to us and their ministry in the past, and uh, we're thankful that he's back here, and he was preaching at a youth rally not too long ago that a bunch of our young people went to. And um, my son said he was blessed by it, and he was there, and so that's encouraging. And I love anybody that helps my children. So we praise God for that. Brother, come along. Uh, maybe give us a, a reintroduction for some of our people that may not know you as well. I know you have a presentation, and then bring us the word. Amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor. How do you say your last name, bro? Galarakis. And that is Greek, right? It is Greek. My, um, my one daughter-in-law... Her, um, I can't say his name either, but her stepfather is Greek, and he always, he loves to eat, man. He's a little bigger than you, though. A little bit. Do you like to eat still? I do. Amen. All right. I do. All right. Like I love Greek. I've, I've always said the Greeks, 
can make anything. I'll never forget one time being in a Mexican restaurant, and I'm thinking, this food is delicious. And I thought, I'm going to tell you know, the, the cooks back there how good it is. I go back there, and there's, it was owned by a Greek family. And uh, it was better than Mexicans cooking Mexican, amen. So good to be here with you. I had to apologize to the pastor. I remember him, and I met his wife, um, not for the first time. I remembered her as well at the youth rally, but I forgot the name and the face. And so she said, I'm the pastor's wife. And I said, I'm so sorry. It's good to be here with you today. Um, you guys, for those that may not know me and my wife, she's back home. Uh, where we stay with the grandkids. We actually stay down in southeastern Ohio right now, and so she's down there with the grandkids, and the work we started at church in West Virginia, she's there in the services today. But I just want to say, my name is Jim Mayles, my wife's Lori. We have prayer cards, I, I'm assuming will be in the back, and um, we have four children. Three of the four are now all married. Life goes fast. I'm looking at this guy right here in the front, and uh, Brother Sedlak, um, his father-in-law was the preacher that preached at Detroit Avenue Baptist. I was under that church, going to church with my par parents, and at 13 years old, I got saved under his preaching. And then um, he really, really a powerful preacher. And so it's just, it just neat. It really is. You look down and see this fella. Time goes by fast. Um, just a real quick introduction to the video. Let me say, if you have any questions tonight, Later, after the service, I'm, I'm staying with my parents tonight in Ridgeville, so um, I grew up there, so you feel free to ask. I'm not in a hurry. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. You're going to see in the video, we've been a little different than a lot of church planners, a lot of missionaries in the world that, in, among independent Baptists. Now, I, I don't think it's wrong. I've been asked many times, Brother Males, do you think it's wrong to go to one country and stay there the rest of your life? Absolutely not. But I don't think it's wrong to go where the Holy Ghost leads. Amen. And that's what I think the emphasis is in the book of Acts. And uh, that's why those men would go to different places, different cities. And so I, I just think if we walk with the Lord and do his will, that's the best thing. And so we started two churches in Scotland over 18 years there in Scotland. We started two churches in Nova Scotia, Canada, which is Gaelic for New Scotland. The Scots settled that part of Canada. And then we started one in West Virginia, which if you're from there, that's a whole different country. My dad's from there. But um, we started a church there as well in New Martinsville, West Virginia. And so I'll let the video tell you about everything. But I just want to say this. The guy you're going to see in the video, um, he's going to give a testimony and tell you. He, he was a church planner. He was working with us. That was the idea. He felt called to church planning. He's from Nova Scotia, from a good church on the bottom of Nova Scotia, Paul Burbage. And during the process of five years starting that church, he felt like the Lord wanted him to pastor that church. And so he is not a church planner. He's now the pastor of that church. And uh, that church is doing well. And we'll tell you about that there. And so, like I said, again, if you have any questions after church, feel free to ask. Okay? So we'll show the video. Can we sit here? Okay. <laughs> I'm really excited to tell you about the work that you've partnered with us in doing in Halifax, Nova Scotia, that now, you know, we've completed and my part is done and we're going to move on to start another church. Let me just say, if you're a church that maybe has not partnered with us before and we're with you today, um, we've been involved in church planning for over 30 years and have started five churches in Scotland, New Martinsville, West Virginia and two in Nova Scotia now. But we're really excited, and I appreciate the partnership that each of you have done over the years. And so let's get right into it, and let me show you what the Lord has done here in Halifax, Nova Scotia over the last four and a half years.
my name is Seung Bin from All Nations Baptist Church. I am from South Korea and now I live in Halifax with my family. I have been under Pastor Mel's ministry for four years now and I can tell you that it was one of the most great times that I had. I was able to grow in faith and I learned some doctrine and also he taught me how to walk in the spirit in everyday life. It is sad that I have to send him away and say goodbye to him, but also I'm glad to know the fact that other people, other Christians that Pastor Mills will meet in other place will have the same joy that I had. So it was your support that enabled um, for me to have this great opportunity. And I am sure that continuing support for him um, you can contribute to other people, other Christians to have the same experience and you make a difference in their lives too. So I'd like to say thank you so much for your partnership with Pastor Males and God bless you. I'm an evangelist church planter sent under the authority of Chicagoan Baptist Church of Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, Canada. And my wife Sandy and I have had the privilege to co-labor, partnering with Jim and Lori Males over the last four and a half years uh, in this church plant here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Under Brother Males' leadership, we have seen the Lord save souls, add people to the ministry here, and seen those people grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Over the last year, the Lord has been working deeply in, in my heart and uh, uh, solidifying further a long-term desire and burden to pastor people here in, uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And uh, we are, are uh, honored that the Lord is passing on this ministry to us. So wow, four and a half years and the Lord has done a lot. And I just, I'm excited for All Nations Baptist Church. I'm excited for my good friend and church planning partner Paul Burbage as he takes this church as Titus did uh, for the Apostle Paul to the next level and I'm excited for him doing the ministry there as a pastor and the work that they're going to do pray for all nations Baptist Church and that they would continue on and that they would grow um, also you know in preparing this video I was thinking about you know Jim what's a good way to present the next church plant and, you know, we're going to start a church in the United States, a second church in the United States in southeastern Ohio. I, there's no doubt in my mind the Lord wants me to do this. We would love you to continue to partnership with us. And in preparing for that, I was thinking, you know, why, with COVID and our country suffering, you know, man, maybe I should put this in the video. But you know what the Lord said to me, what he's always said to me? He said, Jim, you don't need to present all that. You just tell them that this is my will. And that's what I've done for 30 years. I honestly have tried to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit and go where he leads. And you have been part, right there with me, partnering and faithful. And I just wanna thank you for that. And I pray that you'll continue to partnership with us in this next church plant and what we wanna do and what the Lord wants to do in Southeastern Ohio. All right, take your Bibles tonight and turn to the book of Acts, chapter 1. I'm pretty sure last time I was with you um, would have been about seven years ago or something like that, and I didn't need these, um, but I do now. So they're reading. Um, I don't need them for every day yet, but I'm sure that's coming. Um, Brother Williams and I were talking back there about our hair turning gray and stuff, and it comes with age, but... I, uh, I just have learned this. You can't beat time, right? Time's going to take its toll. So, All right, take your Bibles, and if you would stand with me, if you can, for the reading of the Word of God. I'm going to preach out of the first five, six verses, but we're going to actually just read from verse number seven tonight down to get started. And then we're going to go back and get our text this uh, evening from the first few verses there. 
But notice what happens here. Let me just say this very quickly because I know you're standing. I don't want to keep you up there forever. But what's happening here is Jesus Christ has risen from the grave, bodily, physically, out of the grave. And he has now been on the earth 40 days, going in and out amongst the church, his church that he started, amen, amongst these disciples. And, and really what you have here is an account of the last things that are said before he ascends. And so I want you to notice with me what happens here. And he says in verse number 6, actually, we'll start. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by him in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? And by the way, the word gazing is defined really in the definition that we see in verse 10. It's the idea of steadfastly focusing on something. And he says, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then return they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Let's have a word of prayer, and then I want to preach a message to you tonight. Let's get our focus back on what Jesus wants. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I pray this evening that you would bless, Lord. Um, I don't have to pray for the preaching of the word. You've promised this book will never go forth if we, if we preach it, Lord, if we don't water it down or add to it or take away. You promise that this book will, will go forth, Lord, your word, and it will not return unto you void. So I thank you for that promise. I'm glad that I do not have to worry about the effectiveness of your word. But, Lord, what I have to worry about tonight is my flesh. And so, Lord, I pray that I would not get in the way tonight. I pray, Lord, that my flesh would not get in the way, but that I would walk in the Spirit, Lord, and listen to what He says. I pray that the Holy Ghost would have liberty to speak Your truth through me tonight, Lord. And, Lord, I pray that everything that is said here tonight will be based totally upon Your Word, founded in Your Word, and, Lord, that it would be founded, Lord, um, and received with a cheerful heart, Lord. I pray, Lord, if there's one here tonight that's not saved, that, Lord, you'd open the truth of the gospel to them. And, Lord, if for those that are saved, and a lot of times Sunday night, Father, a lot of saved people, I just pray you would encourage them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can be seated. Thank you. So I'm going to give you just a little bit of a background here of what's going on, and then I'm going to get right into the preaching tonight, and, and so I don't keep you too long, but I just, what we have here, and I, I think that television, and, I, and I have, I've had televisions, I'll have them again. I'm not, I'm not here preaching against television, so you can let your guard down, you don't have to put up the walls, amen. But I do think that television has numbed us to reading, amen. And to really read something, and to really understand it, you have to use a thing called the imagination, but when you read something that's truthful, you don't have to imagine as and make up what's going on. You just have to visualize. You ever do that when you read the Bible, amen? You're reading about the cross, and in my heart, at least in my mind, I can see the best image of what I think was happening according to what's being said. Well, tonight, if you can visualize and imagine, Jesus Christ has went, come to this earth, Jesus Christ was put into the body, a human body. God became flesh, dwelt amongst men, and preached the gospel for three years of his ministry. And now he has went to the cross, he's died on that cross, and he has bodily, physically risen from the grave. He has done what no man has done before and will ever do again. He didn't come just out of the grave because Lazarus was raised from the grave, but he's never been back, amen? And before he ascends, and before the promise of the Father, the Holy Ghost comes, and the indwelling of the believer begins, and this great commission is thrust forth that we believe in in missions, 
missions and church planning. Before all this happens, Jesus on this last occasion is talking to his disciples and he's giving them, I believe, he's focusing them on things that are important. I don't believe anything I'm going to mention tonight, three things that I see in these first six verses. I don't believe any one of these things that he mentions to them and that is brought up in the context is new to the disciples. He told them that the promise of the Father would come in John 16. Amen? He told them that he would go to a cross. He told them that he would die. He told them that he would rise from the grave. And he told them that he would ascend back to the Father. And he told them of the Great Commission on five different instances. Amen? And not all on the same day. Chronologically different. And so understand here, Jesus Christ is doing what I do many times when I go on a trip, when I'm going to be away from my wife for a while... I focus her on the important things. We don't talk about the weather. We don't talk about what our favorite colors are. We talk about where the life insurance policy is, Brother Williams. We talk about what to do if something would happen to me. Do you bring my body back? I travel a lot in the ministry. What We talk about the things that she needs to be focused on, the important things. And here's what happens. The church, as Jesus is speaking to them and commanding them, and exhorting them, he comes down, and their first question is, when will the kingdom be restored? Now, before you get all upset about that and too hard on these disciples, remember, they're all Jews. And so Matthew 27, Isaiah 53, has been fulfilled. Amen? Zechariah is not fulfilled yet when he returns, but the Messiah has come. He has suffered. They have seen this. They've believed on him. They naturally think the kingdom's going to be restored. But you know what Jesus says to them? That's not for you to know the times or seasons. In other words, don't get caught up in the, 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 the restoration of the kingdom. And we as believers now in the New Testament, I think it's important that in these days we live in, and we are in, a, in the last days. We are at the very verge of the coming of Christ. And I think if we're not careful, it's easy to get caught up in a way Waiting mode where we're almost looking for Christ and we almost get idle and we're not doing what he left us to do. And so how do we do that? How do we get back on focus? What is it that we need to focus on in these last days? What did he encourage these men to focus on is right before he ascends? Well, number one, let me say to you in verses one and two, we need to get our focus back on the authority of Jesus Christ. Did you hear what I said? We need to get our, our focus back on the authority of Christ. I'm going to say something, and it's probably not going to be well received, and it never is, amen. But the truth is, the government itself has no authority to tell this church when, where, and how it meets, amen. We have an authority. The Bible says here in verse 1 and 2, The former treaties have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given, what's that word there? Commandments unto the apostles whom he had chose. Amen? The word commandments, in the definition of, a, of the word commandments, there's a word enjoin. And that word enjoin, it means to instruct or urge. And the word commandments, it's the idea of giving out an order for something to be done. Amen? And so, Brother Sadlak, you know my father, amen? He was a Marine. He's a real strong-willed person, amen? My dad, when my dad would give me a command, it was just like Jesus' command here. It was the idea of enjoining. It was urging me. He was strongly urging me that when he said to me, hey, son, when I get home from work tonight, I know it's summer vacation, but this yard better be mowed and it better be done. You can play all day, do whatever. Football was my thing. Play football all day if you want, but this yard better be done. You know why I listened to him? I'll give you this example, and then I'll say why. Have you ever started a job, and you, you've been working, and there's some guy, all, every time when there's a new guy, no matter where it's at, somebody will be giving out commandments, amen? They'll be saying, hey, rookie, you need to do this. Hey, buddy, we do it this way. And you go on, and you're thinking, oh, okay, okay, and you're fluttering, flustering around trying to get everything done. And then eventually you get the wisdom to finally ask someone, who is that guy? Is that guy a manager? Who is he? And finally you find out that he's a pipsqueak, just like you, and he just... 
and he's not been there any longer and has no more authority. When you find out that he has no authority, his commandments go in this ear and out the other. Well, let me tell you something, friends. Jesus Christ has authority. He is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords. He has authority in his church. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, the Bible says, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Amen. Jesus Christ is the authority of the church. This is not my church. This is not pastor's church. This is not even your church. We as a body of believers, if you're a part of this church, it is the Lord's church and he is the head of his church. Only Christ alone has the authority to tell us whether we meet or we don't meet. Only Christ alone has the authority to tell us if what we want to do, if our plans, if our proposals are right. That is always based on the Word of God. You know why? Because the written Word of God was given by the true God, the living God, and so the living Word will never contradict the written Word. We can have different opinions, but the authority of this church and any church that is the Lord's, amen, is Jesus Christ. Not only that, but what about in the child of God, amen? Let me show you something here. Go with me to Acts chapter 16, and I want to show you something interesting, and this actually will be a verse you think of in the realm of missions. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Paul says in verse number 5, the Bible records Paul after his first, as we would say, his first journey. Paul has went back to the church he was sent out of Antioch, stayed there a while, and then he, he feels led to go. And you remember the dispute they had? Barnabas and Paul have a dispute. The dispute is Paul, Barnabas wants to take John Mark with them. And Paul says, no way, that guy quit, man. We're not taking him. Later we find out that Barnabas saw something that Paul obviously didn't see. Or maybe it was the will of God that Paul took Silas. Now notice what he says here. He says here, in, in, And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. That's a good thing. That would be neat to hear from any church planner. Amen? Amen? Now look what he says, verse 6. Now when they had gone, so here he goes into the new waters. He went back, he visited, the churches started, he encouraged them in the Lord, and they're being strengthened, and they're growing, they're healthy. And he says in verse 6, Now when they had gone throughout Pergia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. So Paul begins on his second journey and as he's going with his team there, and there's more than just one, and as they're going on the second journey, Paul apparently comes to Asia. I don't believe Paul is out of the will of God. I don't believe he's living in some dark sin, amen. I believe the Apostle Paul thinks this is where he's to go. And as he gets to Asia, the Holy Ghost says, he says, I forbid you to preach the gospel in Asia. Did, the, did Asia need the gospel at this time? Would churches later be started in Asia? Absolutely. But Paul had to obey the authority of Jesus Christ, not only as a member of a church, but as an individual believer, as a child of God, the authority of Paul is Christ. Look what he says here in verse 7. After they were come to Messiah, they essayed. That means to scrutinize, to try to figure it out, to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit suffered them not, and they, passing by Messiah, came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he'd seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. So notice with me, on, on the idea of authority, the authority of Christ, he is the authority of the church, but he is the authority of the individual, the child of God. He's the one that tells us where we go and what we do. Let me, let me point something out here to you about Macedonian vision. Do you remember where they went? It was Philippi. That's where they end up in Macedonia. Do you remember what happened in Philippi? There was no man that got saved at first. 
They met a lady named Lydia, a seller of purple, over by the river where they were pray, having a prayer meeting about the church plan and what the Lord wanted them to do. And Lydia got saved. You know who I believe is represented right here in this dream? You know who I think the man is that's calling? Come over here and help us. And Luke says, the penman says, when he woke up and told us the vision, we surely gathering the Lord had called us to go into Macedonia. You know what the word called there means? The word called is invitation by the one who is calling for you to come where they're at. You know what was going on in Macedonia? God had prepared Lydia's heart to be saved. The Bible says when they get down to Philippi, Lydia got saved whose heart the Lord opened. It is so important, child of God, that we understand that the authority in our life is Jesus Christ. We are not liberated. We have not been saved. People say, I'm not under the law. I'm in Christ and I'm at liberty. Your liberty is freedom from the bondage of sin so that you can serve the God that saved you. So understand with me, he is the authority of the believer. And that's not a, an advertisement for Brother Males, but I will add this in. That's the very reason why. I go where the Lord leads. Why? Because he is the authority. Not only that, but let me say this. He is the authority of his creation. This is so important to understand. Go with me to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. And then we'll move on. We're preaching like Cedar Point today. Just remember that. You say, what on earth is he talking about? Well, you know, a roller coaster, they go up real slow and click, 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 and you're scared, and you're like, man, I wish this thing, and you're trying to tell the girl next to you guys, right, that this is nothing, no problem, but inside you're thinking, I wish this thing would get over the hill and get this done, amen. Well, I preach a little bit like that sometimes. We're going to click, click, click up. We're going to be on the second thought, and you're going to be thinking, oh, my word, this roller coaster is never going to go down the hill, amen. And then before you know it, it's over, and I'm going bye-bye, amen. So hang with me now. Look in Daniel chapter 2. And notice what Daniel says to the king, Nebuchadnezzar. I think this is one of the most interesting verses in the Bible. When you and I, you know, I've never heard anybody go to this scripture ever in my life to get encouragement when they get down and depressed and when they let the cares of this world overtake them. But I think it's a great verse for that. Look what he says in verse 20. Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God. Forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Now there's a colon. We're not done. Look what he says. And he changeth the times and the seasons. Do you believe that? He removeth kings and setteth up kings. Look at me, America. I'm an American. You may not like President Biden, but I assure you God was not in heaven the day after he was elected, whether you think it was rigged or not, God did not sit in heaven and say, oh my word, Biden got in, what am I going to do now? Amen? Well, we like the sovereignty of God when it suits us. But look what he says here. Here's what he says. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth in him. You get that, what he's saying there? He knows what's in the darkness. But friend, if you want light on this, this journey of the Christian walk after you're saved, it's only in him. In fact, the Bible says my life is hid. My new life, once I'm saved, is hid in Christ. Do you understand God is in control? He is the authority over his church. He is the authority over his, his children. And friend, he's the authority over this creation. This is the devil's world, the, the little G God of this world. This system is his. But friend, let me encourage you. He is not in control. My God is in control. And no matter what's coming our way, and I'm just going to say to you and I, and Brother Williams, you've been in some countries, third world countries. I've been in places where it costs something to serve God. And I think it'd be good for every American to go to Russia with me, go to Moldova, go to Eastern Europe, where if we get caught preaching that night, whether you're an American with a passport or not, you're going to jail that night. I think it would do us good. Now we get all upset, and now we're worried about the end. And now we start thinking as Americans how desperate and terrible it is seeing our freedom slowly erode. Well, let me tell you something, friend. It's going to get worse before the Lord comes. We better get our focus on his authority. Because if our focus is on the authority of man, we will f compromise 
and fail the Lord. Second of all, notice with me, we need to focus on his authenticity. Can I get a little bit excited about this one? Amen? I think I'm gonna, all right? Because this gets me excited, because I've been on both sides of this coin. Acts chapter 1, notice with me, if you will, and look in verse 3. We see his authority. We need to focus on his authority. But what about his authenticity? You say, what does that mean? Well, the word authenticity or something that is authentic, it simply means this. It's something that is worthy of acceptance or belief as conforming to or based on fact. Let me say that again. Something that is authentic is worthy of acceptance and belief. Why? Because it's conforming to or based on fact. Look what the Bible says here. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. Now think about that. Many infallible proofs. Being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And for time's sake, I'm not going to take you over there, but the Bible makes record that Jesus, after he ascended, he wasn't seen of just 11 because Judas has now hung himself and he's went to his own place, the Bible says, but he's been seen of over 500 witnesses. And at the time the Bible was penned there, were alive, many of them alive still to this day. Do you know that in any country, in any judicial system, if you had that many witnesses of an event, it would be a no-brainer that it would be proof that it really happened. Amen? I don't want to prove to you that Jesus is who he says he is. I would think in a church, knowing Brother Jenkins and now your pastor, that you understand, you know enough of the Bible. He is the authentic Meshua, amen? He is Messiah. He is the true one. He is God who became flesh. But here's what alarms me, man. I see in the life of these men, and I'm going to show you in Acts 4 in a moment, what happens when somebody embraces the authenticity of Christ. It changes your life. Acts chapter 4. There are two men here that are good preaching. They get in trouble. They get beaten. They get thrown in prison. They get questioned. They get threatened more. And finally, they're released, and they go back to the church. You know who they are? Peter and John. Now, can I ask you a question? Do you remember anything about Peter and John? Do you remember anything about them? Here's what we usually remember about Peter, if we're honest. Peter's the one that always opened mouth and inserted foot. Amen? I can relate to that, Brother Steve, because I, I'm like that. Amen? I've gotten in trouble more for being open and honest and speaking my mind, brother, than not. Amen? So Peter, he's the one that says to Christ, right after the Holy Spirit, and Christ makes it clear, the great profession, thou art the Christ, amen? Where, where could we go? You're the Christ. You're the chosen one. We believe you're the Messiah. Then he turns around as Jesus begins to expound on how he's going to go to the cross and be buried and, and die and be buried and rise again. He begins to what? Rebuke Jesus, saying, no, suffer it not. No, it can't be. And Jesus has to turn and say, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savest not the things of God. Do you remember Peter when Jesus said, I'm going to die again? And Peter says, no, Lord, I'll, I'll die. I'll pull my sword out. I'll chop the ear off. I'll die for you. And Jesus says, Peter, Peter, amen, before the cock crows tomorrow, you will have denied me three times. But the best one is the apostle Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration. Not every disciple got to, they didn't all get to go to this occasion, amen. That was a special thing. Three of them went, amen. James, John, and Peter. And they're on the Mount of Transfiguration. They see the glorified Christ. They hear him, see him communing with Moses and Elijah. And you know what Peter does? Peter comes up with this stupid statement again. He says, Master, it's good for you. It's good that we're here because now we can build a tabernacle for Moses and Elijah and for you. You know what the word tabernacle means there? It's the same idea of the tabernacle of God. It's the dwelling place. It's the dwelling place of God. We know God isn't confined to a tabernacle, but it's where they met and worshiped God. You know what Peter just did? He brought Moses and Elijah onto the level of Christ. And you know what happens immediately when he says that stupid statement? A cloud comes down from heaven. You can't see anything. And when the cloud ascends, the only one standing there is Jesus. And the heavenly voice, the Father says, 
This is my beloved son, hear him. What about the Apostle John? We're going to get, we're going to get in and move. But what about the Apostle John? Do you remember when Paul said, I am a man of like passion? Aren't you glad of that, brother? I am glad that, I, that these men were just men. I'm glad that they weren't gods. I'm glad that they were not superhuman. I'm glad that I'm not glad David committed adultery, but I'm glad to know that David had a flesh like me and he had to guard his flesh. Amen. I'm glad to know that. Because why? Even John, the apostle whom Jesus loved, the one that laid his head on his bosom, amen. The one that when when Jesus said, One of you will betray me, and, and all the disciples looked to John and said, Ask him, ask him, who is it? Which one is it? The very trustworthy John in Revelation 19, as he's receiving the revelation, he just saw the marriage of the Lamb. And the messenger comes, and you know what he does in chapter 19 of Revelation? He begins to bow down to worship that which should not be worshipped. And the messenger says, get up on your feet, don't worship me, worship God. Now I'm saying all that to you to say this. These two men that did those things that failed their master, that failed their God. Have you ever failed your God? Have you ever failed the master? Have you ever gotten your focus off of him and his authority? Have you ever gotten your focus off of his authenticity? You know why Peter was afraid when they accused him of being one of Christ's men? Because he was his focus was not on the authentic Christ. If he really believed and had his focus that Jesus was the one, he would know that everything was going to be okay. Let me show you what authenticity does when you embrace it. I'll give you four thoughts. We're just going to read the verses. Look with me, first of all, in Acts chapter 4, and look with me in verse number 8 through 11. Look what he says here. He says this, And Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of the builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. I want to ask you a question tonight. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Did you hear what he just said? There's salvation in none other. Billy Graham didn't believe that. He was asked on Larry King, what what would happen if someone doesn't, a a Muslim, whoever it is, a Catholic, if they don't receive Jesus as Savior and believe on him that he is who he said, he said, what, will they die and go to hell? And here's what he said. Larry King, the old Jew, knew what the Bible said. And here's what Billy Graham said. Go on YouTube, you can watch it. He said, I can't say. Well, I'm going to tell you right now. Peter and John said, Joel Osteen being interviewed by the same interviewer was asked, if people die without your Christ and don't believe in your gospel, do they go to hell? Joel Osteen said, it's not for me to judge. I can't say whether they will or not. This book says they will. There is salvation in none other name, no other name given, Jesus Christ. You know what authenticity does? It produces confidence. You know why Christians walk around and they're the silent majority? No, the silent minority. Because we're scared to death that we might offend or that somebody might get their feelings hurt. Or maybe we're embarrassed of our Lord. You say, I would never be. Watch your tongue because Peter said the same thing and he denied him three times. Understand with me, my friends, the reason we're embarrassed, the reason the Muslims, when I dealt with many Muslim friends in Europe, the reason they were bold, they would get in any public place on their knees and they would pray to the East, the reason they would talk about Allah and Muhammad is because they thought they had something authentic. We have something authentic, and yet we tell no one. You know how the church in the book of Acts grew? Every church grew? Every church because it wasn't through soul winning programs. I love door knocking. I've always done it, always will do it. I think it's good for me. But I'll tell you how churches grew in the book of Acts. Word was preached, they were edified, they were strengthened, they embraced the authenticity of the book and of the Savior of the book. 
and they went out and they could not stop talking about Jesus. This church would be filled. But we're in a different day, preacher. Oh, I tell you, my friends, if we will get out and we will let the Spirit of God lead us and we will embrace the authenticity of Christ, we too will have confidence. What about boldness? Look at this real quickly. He says in verse number 29. In fact, let me show you verse 13. For time's sake, I'll show you verse 13. This is a better verse. says the same thing. He says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, so where'd that boldness come from? Well, he tells you, the Bible tells you, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now, I want you to think about this. How would you like it, preacher, if somebody met you in the back, like they do, and they'll say good message. If they don't like it, they just don't say anything, right? I hope, amen. Usually the ones that say the good things, sometimes pretty long down, soon down the road, they're going to tell you the bad things, amen. But how would you like a preacher if somebody met you back there? Boy, I wouldn't like this. How would you like, Brother Steve, you go back, you preach somewhere, and you're walking out of the church, somebody grabs you and says, man, brother, preacher, that was a great message. This is exactly what they're saying. That was a great message. I can tell that you have been with Christ. I can tell that you have been with the Savior. I can tell by your preaching. Why? Because you're unlearned and ignorant. Is that what they said? That's what they said. They perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. You know what that really means? Very simple. They decreased and Christ increased. You know what it does when we embrace his authenticity? I'm telling you, America, we better wake up. We better wake up. God Almighty is in control. And buddy, he is authentic. And he will keep his word. But if our focus is on everything else, if, our fo if we don't embrace his authenticity, we're not going to have that confidence, that boldness. We're not going to have vision. And let me say this. What about loyalty? Look at verse 18 here. He says, And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. You know what the next phrase would be if most of us, including me, I'm afraid to say sometimes, if we were filling in verse 20 with, with our answer, you know what it would be? Oh, we might do the same thing, whether it's right or wrong in the sight of God or men. But you know what our answer would be? It would be this, for we cannot but speak the things which, which are our duty. Which are our duty. Do you know that you can serve God? You can do godly things without God? you know that's possible? If it's not, then Paul owes us an apology in Romans 14. Because in Romans 14, the Bible says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Do you understand? We were not saved by works. We didn't please God with works unto salvation. And we don't please God with just works alone. We please God by doing those works through the leadership of the Holy Ghost. That's how we please God. The things, do you ever, stu do you ever study the judgment seat of Christ? That's not about you didn't read your Bible one week. It's not about you missed church or you said a word you shouldn't say. The judgment seat of Christ is about our works and what we've done in the name of God. Those very deeds, those very good deeds are going to be judged. So how is it that some get burned up and some come through the fire is gold? Because there are many of us, and I've done it myself, even in ministry, we serve God in the flesh. You know what their answer is? Their answer wasn't it was duty. They said, for we cannot but, but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Who did you meet with this morning when you woke up? Who did you meet with this morning? I don't know the answer to that. You know who I met with this morning? The Lord. You see, I've seen the Lord do miracles. When my God tells me, given it shall be given unto you, I know that's true because I've experienced God's miraculous hand. I've seen God give us in Scotland that building that was valued at a million dollars for $50,000. I've seen God do these things. I've seen God do miracles. I've seen God take people from a church I hear, amen, that's against this church in a debate and save them and make them a preacher. I've seen him do those things. 
I saw him take a young boy at 11 years old involved in witchcraft and spiritism and save him at 13 years old in Detroit Avenue Baptist Church. That would be me. I know the miracles of God. You see, I don't speak of Christ because it's duty. I speak of Christ because I have experienced his deliverance. So I encourage you today. We need to get our focus back on his authenticity. Let's embrace his authenticity. He is the real thing. But lastly, just go back to Acts 1. And let me, let me give you just one last thought here. And we'll finish up tonight. Notice with me, our focus needs to be on his authority. We need to get our focus back on his authenticity. And we need to get our focus back on the provision of Jesus Christ. Look what he says here in verse number five, if you will. He says this, verse four, I'm sorry. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait. We're going to talk about that just for a few moments and finish up. But look what he said. But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Look at verse number 8. He says this. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the other most part of the earth. Now, I want you to think about something here with me, if you would. Just, just give me about five more minutes, and let's digest this. Think about this with me. Jesus says something here that seems to contradict everything he has told them about the Great Commission up to this point. Say, so what is that? Look at me in verse number, verse number four. He says this, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but what's that word? Say it with me. Wait. Now, preacher, I... I haven't had a chance to talk to you about this, but I think I know the answer because I think we're on the same page. I saw walking down the hall all the, the church planners, missionaries you guys support. Would you agree with me? Or let me ask you this. I'll ask you. Do you believe that the Great Commission, when it says, generally speaking, the gist of the Great Commission is this, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Tra re reproduce, amen. Preach the gospel, see people saved, baptize them, and by the way, teach them the word of God, doctrinally teach them, indoctrinate them, amen. And by the way, if, if this isn't a place where there's no church, what do you do? Organize them under the authority of the New Testament church and reproduce. Would you agree with me? Is that commission a waiting commission or is that a commission where you have to act? Are you going to fulfill the great commission by waiting or going? Talk to me tonight. Going. You have to go. Then why does Jesus say here right before he ascends, wait? He says, go again. He says, after you wait, you go back to Jerusalem and you wait. After you receive the Holy Ghost, you wait, you wait, you wait. And after you wait and you've done what I said, the Spirit of God, the indwelling the earnest of our inheritance, amen, the, the sealing, we are sealed by the Spirit of God. He is our protection. We have God's stamp on us, and the devil knows those that are the Lord's. His protection, just like the sons of Sceva, when they saw the exorcisms, they saw the apostles casting out demons, and they said, man, we want to be a part of that. And they went into the house with the demon-possessed man, and they said, hey, in the name of Jesus, we adjure thee, come out. And the demon looks at him and says, hey I know Jesus and I know Paul but who are you how did that demon know they were not of his because they didn't have the sealing of the Holy Ghost here's what I'm saying to you why do we wait well there's a reason we have to wait because the truth is they needed to wait that they might receive the Spirit of God and why is that let me show you one verse Romans chapter 8 and we're gonna finish with this Romans chapter 8 the book of Romans, chapter 8. I got a new Bible, so you should beat me there. Over the last probably 12, 13 years of my life, saved since I was 13, I'm 55, preaching the Word of God for many years, started numerous churches before this, 
But for the last 12, 13 years of my life, I believe that the Spirit of God has finally put me, not that he was late or tardy, but I believe he has showed me what this is really about. Amen? The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 this. He says this in verse number 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. What did Jesus say he came to bring? Life that they might have it more abundantly. And peace I leave with you, not as the world giveth give I unto you, his peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity. Do you know what the word enmity means there? It's a, it's a pretty powerful word. It means hostile, hatred. You ever see the bumper sticker, I found God? Well, let me tell you something. God was never lost, amen? No man ever found God. God found me in a lost, sinful state with a nature. And people, even Baptists, do not like to hear this. But Paul says, my carnal mind, my old nature that I was born with, it hates God and it's hostile to God. You know how I know that? Go read the book of Revelation. When the tribulation begins, men are hiding in the, the dens and the caves. And they're saying, save us from the wrath. Fall on us and save us from the wrath of the Lamb. They know who, whose wrath it is. But by the time you get over to chapter 16, you know what they're saying now? The Bible says, even knowing that it was the wrath of God, the judgment of God, you know what they do? They blaspheme God to his face and they will not repent of their deeds. You know what salvation by grace means? I didn't deserve salvation. I definitely wasn't trying to follow or seek after God. But the Spirit of God, through the preaching of the gospel, opened my eyes, as Paul told the church at Corinth, and I got saved when the light of the glorious gospel shined in. Let me say this in closing. We need to start doing the work of the Lord in the power and the leadership of the Spirit of God. Think about this. Who is it when you go out and talk to someone about the Lord? If they don't get saved, were you a bad salesman? No. The Bible says when he has come, the Spirit of God, he will reprove, convince. That's what the word means. The world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. When I preached at youth rally the other day, there were girls. I was told there were some young people that were unsaved visitors on the one side and they were holding the pew the, the I say pew but the chairs and they were shaking and they were weeping there were two girls I don't know who they were my brother was told about them you say oh preacher man what could you have done better I can't do anything better amen I have to rely that the Holy Ghost had brought them under conviction and even though when they leave and they're not under the sound of my preaching of the word of God the God's spirit will do exactly the ministry that he brought he was sent to do. Listen, we need to get back to this provision because I'm going to tell you right now what's coming to us. I'm studying the book of Revelation again. Do you know that Russia and Iran and Syria and Turkey, does that sound like a familiar portion of Scripture in the Bible? They're in Syria right now. Have you not been reading the news? I watch a broadcast about Israel. I enjoy that. And he told us this a month ago that Russia had went there. They're doing joint military maneuvers. I'm telling you, my friends, we are getting close to the end. And if you and I try to wing this thing, if we try to just muster up enough courage to get through this, we're going to be disappointed. But if we'll get our eyes and our focus back on the authority of our Savior, back on his authenticity. He's the real deal. And if we will get our focus back on his provision, Lord, lead me, guide me. Tomorrow, Lord, when I go out of my place, my home, whether it's work or give me divine appointments, lead me to people like Lydia that you're working in. Lord, give me the strength and the courage, the grace to get through these times. And if we'll do that, and if our focus is right, I promise you this book cannot lie. It cannot lie. The disciples asked Jesus, they, they asked Jesus, when are you going to restore the kingdom? 
Don't worry about that. You're going to wait. You're going to get power. You're going to do my will. He ascends. They get caught gazing, waiting, holding back. You may like this song, and that's okay. I'm not making this a sinful or a non-sinful thing. But I'm not a big fan of Hold the Fort for I'm Coming. I really don't like that song because Jesus never commanded his church to hold a fort. He commanded us to be on the onslaught. The gates of hell shall not prevail against us. Do you know what the word gates there is talking about? That's the last line of defense for an old or new testament city. Friend, we are on the attack. We don't sit back and wait. We watch. You know what the word watch means? To be ready. To be ready. Are you ready tonight for the coming of the Lord? Are you ready for the things that are about to come? Let's get our eyes focused back on that which Christ wants. Amen. Let's stand together, Pastor, you come. Thank you, brother. As we stand to our feet, would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? In our church, we have what we call a time of invitation where we invite you to act on what it is that God is speaking to you about. Christian, if we don't believe that God has authority, we won't pay attention to his word. And if we don't see him for who he is and what he is, we won't go for him like we ought to. And if we try and go for him without his power, then we will surely become discouraged as nothing is produced. If you're here tonight and you don't know Christ as Savior, I want you to know that that is where it all begins. And that is the thing that you need above everything that was preached tonight, is to come to know God through a relationship in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing that he died for your sins, was buried, and rose from the grave. But I imagine that many of you are here, and probably a number of you that are watching, that have joined us online. You are a believer, and you do know the Lord. What does God have for you tonight? And the answer is to be about the things that matter, to refocus. This world has so many distractions and so many things that just don't matter. It's unbelievable how many things don't matter in this world. But this world screams that they do matter. What are our eyes on in this time when we have so little time? Is it on the things of God or the things of this earth? Where have you set your affection, friend? On the things above or on the things here that are passing away? Every once in a while, we need an alignment in our vehicles to get them straight again, to drive properly. And every once in a while, we need a realignment of our heart as God's children to love the things that he loves and to be about our Father's work. If that's you tonight and God's spoken to you about that, say yes to the Lord and say, Lord, realign my priority. Give me a heart for the things that you love. Let me do it in your power. Father, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that in this time of invitation, your children would say yes to you, that you be glorified through their obedience. I pray that you would help us to have your heart, your mind, and your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we sing.
pray together. Father, seal these things in our hearts. Help us to have our eyes upon Jesus. And as the message and the song have so well said, all of these things of this world will go, grow strangely dim. And may that be the truth of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Brother, thank you so much for bringing us the word. And if you haven't had a chance, church family, to get to, to speak with Brother Mills, I, I pray that you would do so tonight. Uh, because if it was seven years since we've seen him last, who knows when we'll have the opportunity again. So, and um, we'll definitely have the opportunity again one day. And we'll have all the time we could ever ask for. But get a chance to speak with him. Get his prayer card. He has a number of them. They're out there in the lobby. And pray for him. Pray for him. We have Rainbow Fellowship this week, which is our 55 and older luncheon and time of prayer and Bible study. That's this Thursday at 10 a.m. We'll be gathering together. It'll be a potluck meal, so bring something to share. And we'll be gathering in the fellowship hall here. And I, I look forward to that time. And so invite somebody. Make the effort to come. Make the effort to come. Also, ladies, there's a game night. I had a little note about it that I probably lost. I believe it is on the 18th. Thank you, brother. It's on the 18th from 7 to 9 p.m. Bring your favorite game. Uh, snacks will be provided, but if you have a, a favorite um, uh, beverage, right, if you want to bring some teas or all of those things, I know that's stereotyping. Maybe you want to bring Red Bull, and that's what you want to bring to the game night. You bring it, right? I won't drink that stuff, but you bring it, I guess, if you want it. And then uh, the attire is supposed to be casual, even to the level of pajamas. Is that what I understand? If that's what they want? All right. Well, then you do that. You do that. I'm not wearing my footy pajamas here, but if you want to, that's on you. And there's a sign-up sheet for it on the involvement board. Let us know who's coming so that we can make sure we have everything ready for that number of people. Uh, we have a couple of prayer requests to ask for you to pray about. Pray for uh, Brother Wagner that God would... in just encourage him. He keeps getting uh, bounced around in and out of the hospital, bad news here and there. Ask the Lord to bless and help. Uh, pray for the Nugabowers, which is a, a wonderful Christian family that are just going through such trouble. The wife has stage four cancer. The husband's in serious condition in the hospital, and they just, they've been holding on, taking care of one another, and they're in, they're in bad shape. They're in bad shape. So if you'd ask the Lord to bless and help them through this, I know it would mean a lot to the, the folks that love them and consider them to be family. Um, pray for our marriage retreat that's coming up on the 25th and 26th, that the Lord would work. Uh, you know, with all of these quarantine things that happened and everybody staying home, you know what came out of that? A bunch of people couldn't hide from their problems anymore. And, and they couldn't go to work and hide, and they couldn't go do their favorite things and hide because we were stuck together. And the problems came out into the open. And a lot of counseling has been done over this past year and a half. I know Pastor Steve's shaking his head, and I've done more in this past year and a half than I've ever done. And you know what helps that? Preventative maintenance, right? So you, you attend if you've signed up. I believe all the seats are full right now, but we have a waiting list. And so if you want to get in on that, let us know. Let Pastor Steve know or myself. You do the preventative maintenance, and you find that it runs a whole lot better as we seek to be like Christ in our homes. So pray for that, that God would bless and use. Anything I'm forgetting, brother, from this morning? All right. Well, let's stand together, shall we? Let's stand together for our closing prayer. Thank you for being faithful to God's house tonight. And may the Lord bless you as you go. Be safe out there. And I'll see you on Wednesday night. Why should you come back for Wednesday night? Why should you come back for Wednesday night? You said, I already went to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night. Why should I come back? Well, you also already ate breakfast this morning. Are you going to do it again tomorrow? I think you might. If you skip breakfast, you ate lunch today, you're going to eat it tomorrow? It's because it's what you need to live and grow. So be here Wednesday night, 7 p.m., in the Word of God, and you'll see the Lord do something special. Uh, I trust that he will. Brother Mike Swarm, would you close us out in prayer? <laughs> just when I need him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just.
just when I fear, ready to help me, ready to cheer, just when I need.